we can't just allow people to continue to get burnt out day after day and then hope that they will you know, wake up and feel better someday. We have to have the resources in place. So Jesse, how do organizations begin to broach the topic of burnout with their employees? So with eight and 10 workers identifying as burnt out, I think it's safe to assume that at least some of your workers are burnt out, even if you are performing better than the average. So then the question is who is burnt out and what do I do about it? I think before you even address those questions, it's so important to establish the right environment for a discussion around health and wellness and burnout. Um, Some questions that you might be asking yourself or your fellow leaders might be, do I or do you have the right training to discuss mental and physical wellness? Do employees typically share this information openly? Will they be comfortable to do so? And is the intention around this discussion about performance or are you putting performance completely aside and is this really about employee wellness? So it's important to really set the stage and make sure that the appropriate context is set before broaching the topic of burnout. Totally agree. And I think we're gonna get into this a little bit later about how important psychological safety is and how important it is for the manager and the leader to create that space for people to share and how to handle that conversation with high emotional intelligence so that it's effective, right? And it doesn't have the reverse effect when someone feels courageous enough and brave enough to step up and share. And then it's met with um, low emotional intelligence, then that's going to create an even more systemic problem. So with that being said, I'd like to go back to your personal story, Jesse. Can you tell us more about how you handled that situation and what you learned from it? Yeah, so I'm really passionate about making sure that managers are trained to have these conversations because of my personal experience um, exploring a medical leave. I had never even met with HR in my entire career. So talking to HR and talking to my manager about my personal wellness was so intimidating and scary for me. And I consider myself someone who very easily advocates for myself and very easily says what's on my mind. And still, this was incredibly intimidating. Um, And so for those unfamiliar with a medical leave, you don't have to tell your manager or your leadership or even your team that you are going on a medical leave due to HIPAA compliance. The entire process moves through HR and in partnership with you and your doctor. And so in my case, I had been updating my manager week over week on my um, physical symptoms that were happening with my fibromyalgia and my burnout. And so I felt comfortable to tell him that I was exploring a medical leave and I was planning to meet with HR. And I was not expecting his response, which was, Um, He was very angry and upset, and he actually told me that I was not allowed to go to HR on my own, that I had to be introduced to HR through him first. I knew this was untrue because I had already set up my meeting with HR and I was just letting him know as a courtesy. Um, So of course I rebutted and told him, you know, I I do plan to go to HR on my own. Um, This is a really personal topic to me and I want to keep this conversation private. And he responded by saying, how do you think that this will make me look? Sorry, I'm getting emotional now. (laughs) Um, And so, you know, obviously this was a painful situation for me and you can tell from my response right now that it still is emotional, but this is more than just a poor employee experience. Um, From a business and legal standpoint, it is illegal for uh, anyone in the organization to block you from exploring a medical leave or going to HR. And then on another note, it really wasn't reflective of the company culture or values. Um, This was someone who had been promoted year after year after year. And so the reason why I bring this up is because I believe this stemmed from poor training and preparation around this conversation. I think it's not safe to assume that leaders or managers have the skill set to have these conversations. Formal training needs to happen. Um, And it's because these conversations create this emotional response for all parties involved. And so formal training needs to happen. The investment in formal training will pay you back dividends in terms of your employee happiness, um, as well as, you know, your employees 
psychological safety. And brand reputation. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm so sorry that happened to you, Jesse. And kudos to you for being courageous and standing up to that person because I could imagine being someone younger in the job, super driven, high performing, and having health issues and being brave enough to speak up you likely could have shut down, right? And then continued to suffer in silence, but you didn't. You stood up for yourself and advocated and that's that's amazing and should be celebrated. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And I also think it's a testament to the impact that leaders have on the lives of their people. And it's incredible to me that you took that negative and painful experience and turned it into an opportunity to help others. For the sake of this discussion, Let's assume that all the training that you mentioned, which I also believe is critical, has happened. At that point, what can managers begin doing to address burnout? So after getting the right training and establishing the right context, it is appropriate to facilitate an open discussion about burnout. Um, even after this training has happened, if this is your first discussion around your employee wellness, um, consider that employees might be taken aback and not quite ready to share, and that's okay. Um, this should be an important issue regardless if people are willing to share in the first conversation, second conversation, or third conversation. But make it personal to you and tell your employees why this is important to you. I would also say consider there is some burnout research that women are more likely to speak up on burnout than men are. So if someone isn't speaking up, that doesn't mean they're not experiencing burnout. That doesn't mean that they don't have an opinion on it. It just might mean that they're not comfortable to speak up at this time, which is okay. I think another powerful thing that managers can do is help their team administer a self check-in. And this will empower not only the manager to check in on themselves, and I would recommend doing that before this conversation, but it will also empower the team to check in on themselves and really collect the data on how they're feeling before they say they are or not experiencing burnout. I think it's, like I said, people are quick to blame themselves and say things like, I think I'm just being lazy um, when that's not the case. And so I think it's important to help them administer a self check-in, tell them to look for signs of depletion or exhaustion, mental distance, negative feelings or cynicism toward their job. Were they typically excited and chasing down op opportunities and now um, they're more removed and more apathetic? This is a critical sign of burnout. Reduce professional efficiency, more errors um, or errors where they wouldn't usually make them or forgetfulness. Again, easy place to blame ourselves, right? We say, oh, I'm distracted today or I'm scatterbrained. There could be more there. And then finally, diminished desire to learn and grow. So is most of their focus and their day-to-day just on getting through the day or are they having the energy to develop for the future once they've done this self check-in encourage them that you are open to discussing this further um, if they are open to sharing thank you jesse those are really great tips i'm a firm believer that workload and engagement should be checked in between manager and direct report on a regular basis after talking with you today i will now add specific questions related to burnout um, yeah, it's that empathy and care as a manager, truly caring about your people and being willing to check in on them and have these vulnerable discussions to make sure they're safe and, and protected and succeeding. Jesse, what are the bigger physical and mental health issues that come from being burnt out? So in my personal experience, burnout led to, you know, a myriad of symptoms and I thought I was alone in this. Um, but as we saw, as we see in the Gallup research, burnout employees are 23% more likely to end up in the emergency room and they're 63% more likely to take a sick day. So burnout can lead to many different illnesses. According to NASDA, about 90% of disease begins with stress. And if you're wondering how that's possible, um, again, think about what's happening in our body when we are stressed. Our nervous system goes on high alert. We move from what's called rest and digest, which is a state of natural calmness where we feel safe in our surroundings, to fight or flight, which is a state of survival where we don't feel safe either psychologically or physically. Um, in fight or flight, what I call the big three becomes impaired. This is your heart, your lungs, and your stomach. So it's common to experience an irregular heartbeat. 
um, shortness of breath or impaired breathing, uneasiness in the stomach, trouble digesting, and trouble absorbing nutrients. So you can imagine how this impairs the entire immune system and increases your susceptibility to a myriad of diseases or illness. Um, I will say another common misconception is, you know, the whole bear in the woods example. We only go into fight or flight when we see a bear in the woods. No, fight or flight can happen after stressful meetings or because of a, you know, unbalanced workload. And we can stay in that state for months. So this is why um, it's so important to take time to recover and come out of fight or flight because it makes us very vulnerable. Jesse, you've been incredibly vulnerable and I'll share some vulnerability with you in that that I have been talking with a therapist for about a year now. And a lot of what we work on is, he calls it flipping your lid. So when you get into a space where your emotional brain takes over, how can you get yourself to a place where you turn that down, turn the dial down and get away from the bear in the woods and start to trigger your thinking brain? And those tools and techniques, which I know you know and you share with organizations when you work with them, have been incredibly, incredibly helpful for me as I try to work through this journey because I believe my burnout came from a variety of um, situations, specifically around the pandemic. And I can't help but think about my community here in Southern California of working moms. We all went through over one year of distance learning with our kids, which was essentially homeschooling when we didn't choose to be homeschooling moms. <laughs> we also became teachers, therapists, advocates for our kids, um, all on top of managing our careers, managing our relationships, teaching learning pods and whatever else we were doing to try to keep the wheels on the bus to get through this pandemic and give our kids the best chance that we could. And I know so many people that are burnt out right now. And it's not just working moms, as you mentioned before, you know, it's, it's everyone that this is impacting. Um, we've been in fight or flight, managing constant uncertainty and change over the last couple of years. And now we're in a mental health crisis. What can organizations do to support or fix this? Thank you so much for sharing your story, Tracy. I really appreciate it. And it really adds color to what is happening to your people in your organization. This are, these are not numbers. Um, these are real people with real stories and they need help right now. This is an urgent matter. Um, what I recommend to organizations is to start building a culture of wellness. And to me, a culture of wellness has three pillars. They are psychological safety, a common language, and resources. So the first one we'll talk about is psychological safety. This was a term coined by a Harvard Business School professor, Amy Edmondson, and she defines psychological safety as a shared belief that the team is a safe place for interpersonal risk taking. What risk taking looks like in an organization is sharing a new idea, um, providing constructive criticism, um, providing a new way of doing things. Can people make those vulnerable shares without um, fear of repercussions? A psychologically safe climate allows people to speak up and share their ideas without retaliation. And I wanna pause a moment too, because I think so many people are quick to say, I would never retaliate. Um, you know, it seems like a really big thing, retaliation. But I think when we really pare retaliation down to what it is in its most common form, it's when people are undermined. So that could be, you know, laughing at someone or making them think that their idea is, you know, not a good one. Whatever it is, um, these little passing comments can be forms of retaliation. And so for leaders, it's less about what you contribute and more about how you respond and receive the contributions of others. And then finally, you know, what's the benefit of creating a psychologically safe environment? Research shows that teams who have high psychological safety also enjoy higher team performance, higher engagement, higher levels of creativity and collaboration, higher levels of inclusion and higher levels of well-being and lower turnover rates. So really the benefits are endless when it comes to creating a psychologically safe environment. And the good news is that organizations can take active steps 
to build this, to build a culture of psychological safety. And this type of environment will lead to more creativity, more innovation, and a greater sense of belonging for their people. What else, Jesse? I know you mentioned common language. What does that mean? So a common language is a language where people can speak up while still maintaining their privacy. Um, when we're thinking about how we build a common language, I think it's first important to ask ourselves what obstacles or stigma exist today that are blocking employees from speaking up and how can we remove these barriers to better support them. One of the issues that I see in organizations is they don't have the appropriate language for a person to both advocate for themselves and get what they need and also maintain their privacy. Um, I used the example of a basketball coach earlier calling out a play and that's when everyone then knows exactly what to do. He wouldn't wait till the championship game to create this play. It's been practiced um, and created and worked on for this situation. Another popular example of good language was maybe in a crime movie or TV show if you watch those where a team member says code red. And this signals to the team, you know, all hands on deck or we have an issue. Again, they're not waiting till the moment that something bad happens. They have the plan already in place. And the other team members in almost every single case know exactly what to do and they can begin doing it right away. This is what good language can do in these situations. It can elicit this proper and practiced response where the individual doesn't have to dive deep into what's happening or what they need. Um, they can get what they need and still maintain their privacy by using this common language. Yeah, that's super smart. And I've seen more organizations embrace having the common language be rooted in empathy and emotional intelligence. Yeah, Jesse, the last piece that you talked about was resources. Can you share more about that? Yeah, so resources is knowing that stress happens. HBR conducted a study of thousands of individuals and they found that 80% of people said the number one source of stress is work. This is over you know, family and home tasks, money, stresses, and so on, it's, it's work. So now that we know this, we should have recovery strategies in place and then the space and norms to practice recovery at work, knowing that stress is going to happen in the workplace. Um, we can't just allow people to continue to get burnt out day after day and then hope that they will you know, wake up and feel better someday. We have to have the resources in place. I think something really important when we're building resources also is nominating an executive sponsor. And this is so important for role modeling from the top down that wellness is a priority. It will be practiced within this organization and we don't have to sacrifice our well-being for our work here. We can have both. That's amazing, Jesse. And so how do we bring this all to life? So this cannot happen without supporting your managers. Managers, again, are part of the group who are most likely to be burnt out, but they are also the most able to prevent burnout from happening to their associates. So managers are really your biggest touch point. Managers play a critical role in creating this culture of wellness, but they need support before they can support others. So starting an open dialogue and making the necessary changes to support your managers is a really great first step. And role modeling again comes into play here from the top down. Executives are making this a priority. Managers are making this a priority. Individual contributors are making this a priority. And this gives everyone permission to do so. And this then really breeds this culture of wellness in every single corner of the organization, which is what makes wellness really come to life and have this true community of people who are supporting each other in their pursuit of wellness. And that's that role modeling is such an important point, Jesse, and the giving permission. So if I'm your manager and I'm telling you, I'm concerned about burnout, I wanna make sure that your workload is balanced, but then you see me working past the time. You see me sending emails on the weekends. You see me saying things like, oh, I wish I could get to my Pilates class today, but you know, I took a call. Then it doesn't matter what I say to you, you're gonna role model my behavior and then we're in a jam, right? So I think I just wanna reiterate what you said is that it's top down and it's not just 
saying something. You have to practice what you preach and you have to role model those behaviors to allow your direct reports to be able to do the same and have that flexibility to put their health first. A lot of what you shared about psychological safety and shared language can be accomplished to your point through effective communication paired with training and development. This is an area of focus for us here at Sea Change Collective and something that our managers are super passionate about. We love helping organizations build capability in emotional intelligence, conflict resolution, stress management, and tackling burnout. What excites you most about partnering with Sea Change Collective? Well, the mission really aligns with me very well. Um, I told my story today and I can say quite honestly that I never want this to happen to another person ever again. So when you and I connected, Tracy, and you said that you wanted to bring this type of training to managers, it aligned perfectly with what I want to do in creating this culture of wellness. And so the impact wasn't one plus one equals two, it was really one plus one equals 10. There has been a tangible impact on my business um, and how I am viewing this issue and how I wanna fix it. And so being a part of Sea Change has completely skyrocketed my passion for this issue and how I'm approaching businesses. Thank you, Jesse. And I'm so excited to be partnering with you as is the rest of the team because you can just see the amount of subject matter expertise that you have and the passion that you have for that. And then the ability to combine your knowledge and your passion with our experience in building award-winning programs for managers to me is just a, a perfect recipe for helping organizations accomplish this. I just wanna thank you so much for being here again, Jesse, and for the time that you dedicated in chatting with me and prepping for this. Uh, I would imagine there are a lot of people that want to learn more and would love to get in contact with you. Could you just quickly share how they can reach out to you if people want to work with you? Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me, Tracy. It was an absolute pleasure. Um, Thank you to everyone listening. If you do want to get in contact with me, you can fill out a contact form on my website, which is everydayblissco.com, or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. And my LinkedIn is linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Jesse Pagliari. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jesse. I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks so much, Tracy. Appreciate it. Bye.